Okay. So David messaged me mm -hmm. uh, like 20 minutes ago to let me know that he had to take Dasha to an emergency uh, dental appointment. Oh. And he, um, he was going to try to get on the call from, I think, his phone because he asked me to paste in the link. So he may be joining us, but he may also be occupied with matters uh, involving that appointment. Got it. And Jamie also messaged me and said that she couldn't make it. Pam had a couple of weeks ago indicated that she might be here, uh, but she may not be ready yet. So it might just be you and I again for okay. the beginning of this. And if so, I think that's cool. Um, there was so much in these chapters. And I'm evolving my practice of taking notes and reading more closely. And I, I even feel actually that I'm becoming a better reader in the sense that the, the sort of moment-to-moment experience of reading the text and the feeling of a continuity and the feeling of retention and the feeling of like following multiple uh, narrative threads and levels of meaning and then making connections. Like it seems like I'm getting better at it actually. Uh, and, and like, I'm feeling that right now. And uh, it kind of reminds me of um, another thing I've started doing was just playing soccer again. And I just go out with my, soccer ball and I just play by myself there's a park uh, by the school down the road and there's a wall and after school people from the neighborhood can use the park so I go there with my with a soccer ball and sometimes I bring my daughters along and they play on the the jungle gym and I, I just kick the ball around but at first and you know I, I played as a as a young person I was decent I, I was a good player but um yeah I didn't I didn't uh um, oh, there's David. I was just uh, I was just telling uh, Paul about uh, about what what it's been like reading and feeling like I'm getting better reading because when I first went and started playing soccer again, uh, I felt like a just a, a bundle of sticks like <laughs> moving around with no coordination, uh, and the ball was going all over the place. Like I had no like sense for it. I had no touch for it. And now I go and I can just, uh, after just doing it a few weeks, you know, once or twice a week uh, and just juggling and having fun with it and like getting into a relationship with the ball, <laughs> you know, like, like, dan like learning how to move with it and how it feels and the rhythm of it. And uh, I, I can just, I can juggle a hundred, 200, 300 times and without the ball falling on the ground. And I just kind of go and flip the ball over my head and do little tricks and things like that. And I'm just having fun, but it was amazing like how quickly you get better when you just do something. And I think the practice of reading, it, which is becoming in, you know, our digital age, a lost art, you might say is, um, is like that. Uh, and in some ways that the book is teaching me kind of how to read in a certain way, like the teach. And, and I, we can talk a bit about that. Um, but I want, I think uh, now that David has joined, we, we could uh, say hi and I guess get the, get the call started and talk about the text uh, or talk about really whatever we want to. I was, um, we don't have to talk about the text in a linear way necessarily. Um, there's a lot here. Anyway, we'll, we never get through it actually. We could, we could spend a whole, you know, a whole session just on that chapter with Caterby and his philosophy of good and evil and, um, cosmic morality. Um, so we just lost David again. Maybe he'll be back. Anyhow. And you're muted also, Maybe, Paul. maybe he's looking for a better spot. Yeah. Because, uh, okay, so, so how are you doing? Well, I, I concur with that um, thought you're having about being a better reader, hearing other people's take, you know, like how the reading is affecting them, um, uh, 
the process of reading it and then sharing is, um, I think, giving an experience of opening up maybe uh, to a fuller spectrum of what the author is presenting. It makes me appreciate, I guess, the um, complexity and the brilliance and the, the layered quality of the of the book. It's artful in that way. And I notice I'm not necessarily thinking, oh, I'm going to I'm reading something I want to talk about this in the group, but more that the process of what we're doing here is affecting how I'm taking the book in as I read it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mentioned it before, but uh, reading um, with groups has usually involved philosophy books, you know, kind of dense texts. Um, but as I went into this book, I really decided or tried to decide that I would open myself to allow the book to affect me, hmm. you know, to, to just see. And it's, you know, although it's a work of fiction, I do find it very affecting. Hmm. And so it's, 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 I'm on a journey as I'm experiencing the book and in the group. And so um, I do notice I'm feeling uh, highs and lows and, and rather than resist it, you know, like, um, especially with some of these chapters, you know, thinking that, you know, you know, having dubious thoughts about the human race, men in particular, <laughs> <laughs> my own memories of the befuddled bewitchment that love casts and, um, you know, maybe errors in judgment and pride and so forth. So it's like, I'm, I'm, my days are being um, affected, my attitude, even my moods through this process. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I actually, I mean, I want to be before I go back. I, I, David you know, joined, so um, I, I want I want to respond to what you just said, but I also want to make sure that we have a connection with David, so that um, I'm able to hear, hear you guys just fine, and I'm very close to my house to be able to uh, hop on my computer. So, uh, but you guys are coming through beautifully. Okay, great. Uh, is it? Are you in a? Are you driving right now? Then. Yeah, I've got. I'm running the the. <coughs> excuse me, the iPhone version of Zoom, and um, it's just it's just uh, no video right now, and I'm. It's just easy enough to hear you guys. Just a little button for uh, muting, uh, just to kind of spare the call any of my background sound. But yeah, it's really easy to be here. Okay. Do you do you feel like you could participate in the conversation, or do you want to wait until you get home and just sort of listen? While, oh, you're, Mark, while you're driving. Dude, you've, ne you've never been sentenced to a road trip with me. The conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So this is going to be sort of like multimodal dialogue with some of, yeah. us, some of us in motion, some of us indoors yeah. and outdoors. Totally. I, I, w I was uh, just really appreciating what, what Paul said, and I was going to tease him that, you know, you're supposed to talk about yourself, not me, because he was just, I mean, I've been kind of tracking how much, um, how much doing the reading is stirring up for me and, and um, actually challenge myself also in a similar way to just be vulnerable to it um, and not just um, filter it for what feels like emotionally safe entertainment and then let the other more provocative and, and, um, and, you know, um, perturbative elements of the, the story, you know, maybe protect myself a little bit more from them. So it's going in deep this time. And I'm, I'm really finding myself looking forward to this, circle just to sort of have a container to, to bear witness to some of that. So I appreciated your uh, intro, Paul. Yeah, well, thank I've, you. I resonated with it as well. Uh, and um, these chapters particularly bring that, bring it home. And one of the things I've thought about this book is that, uh, and what seems to be unique about it as a work of fiction uh, amongst um, every, any, every other book I've read is that it seems to be a, such a fully lived book. Like the, the book, it's, it, whatever amounts of imagination or artifice or uh, artistry or eloquence that the author puts into it, the core experiences that are being communicated and, and transmitted through that art uh, feel so profoundly lived. Uh, that uh, I, I can't help but um, be uh, effective, you know, as, as you described uh, as well. 
And for those to back the mirror of the of the narrative, the mirror of the story, to like, reflect back, uh, you know, not maybe not literal aspects of my life, but the, the patterns and the kind of deep, deep, deep like, heart that. I don't even know how to approach all this, the, the, all these scenes in the prison, for example, for example, like the, the, the intense violence of it. Uh, I don't think I really even fully took that in. Uh, you know, I think there's a part of me that just put up a bit of a resistance to really feeling what that all really all meant. Um, now that gets into the text. Uh, we may want to structure this a little bit more and kind of take it, in a um, orderly fashion. Um, but, I mean, <laughs> uh, not, the book as a whole, and, and, and then these particular chapters, I think, um, I, I really feel like they're a profound, it's a profound work. And it's, it's a, there's, there's a profound amount of feeling and raw reality that is um, baked into it. It's like baked into it, like, you know, like in the blood. It's like, Nietzsche wrote, uh, uh, Nietzsche wrote, you know, write with your blood. The spirit is in the blood. I only, you know, write things that have my blood in it. And, you know, if, if any work uh, it embodied uh, and led that particular idea, I think this is one of them. Uh, it's really harrowing, actually. Yeah, my sense has um, been drawn to the fact that although the environment is very different, it's alien. I've never been to India, but yet the the, the humanness there's a certain universality, and also if you know, certainly not having been exposed to that level degree of intensity of sustained violence, for instance, in the prison. Nonetheless, any little bits of violence or fighting that I've ever done in my life just came back, the effect of it, the memory, the, the qualities of it. So I didn't have to be in Bombay. He reaches all the way across to my, you know, here in my living room and I can be, be with it. I can't relate at all, actually. Like, I, I've never been a fighter. I've never been, like, a, a, you know, even, like, I got into one very kind of lame fist fight when I was in sixth grade uh, with, with a, a kid who, um, it's a funny story, I guess. Like, uh, I'll, I'll, he, he, was, uh, he, was, he was this kind of, you know, very uh, overweight, um, I'd say like hey, unpopular kid. And he, was, and he was making fun of my girlfriend, like teasing me about it, right? And and then I challenged him to a fight, like I'm in this schoolyard, you know, after after school. And uh, we showed up and we threw some punches, uh, and then some of the other kids started attacking him. And it was just rolling around, and nobody got really hurt, and it was totally lame. Uh, and that's like the extent of it. Uh, there's a couple of other instances where I've had, you know, intense moments, you know, where it feels like violence could be imminent or, you know, something. And I've actually done a bunch of martial arts training, like Krav Maga and karate and Kung Fu. Uh, like I'm a sort of dilettante of, of some martial arts, never good enough to be a black belt or really anything like that, but enough to you know, just do the physical, like, athletic part of it. But I find it, you know, I, I, I cannot relate to the, the violent, the physically violent side of Lynn at all. At the same time, that's just this particular life. Like, that's just me in this incarnation. And that, do, that just means I, I haven't necessarily been in a situation that would have uh, required um, me to act in a way. Uh, that Lynn has to act, for example. I mean, all these situations arise where a certain, you know, series of decisions or choices or events kind of pushes him into a corner and, and you know, or pushes him into a confrontation. Uh, and 
because of his loyalties, because of his uh, sense of integrity, even because of his politics, which is another thing I think we should, we should talk about, he, he chooses that, that course of action, right? And he acts, and he's, he's, a, <laughs> he's vicious, actually, as a fighter. I mean, uh, <laughs> he's crazy, right? And, and he, he, he lets like an inner wild on the floor right there, you know, madman out. In these in these yeah, physical just, just, altercations that he no, had, your left uh, foot in the Kalaba jail uh, for one, and then in the um, what was it called the uh, Arthur Road prison. Uh, and I don't want to re- you know relate exactly what, what happens. I, I might leave the honors to you or to David, but um, uh, it's you know it's quite something to read about, even just virtually. And to like imagine myself like in situations that I'm, I'm the course of my life has not put me in, uh, but that are real, right? Like we we're, we're tying into a whole um, network of violence that connects with politics in the Middle East. It, con- it really is all connected, uh, and and we get a real sense of that in the chapters. Uh, so uh, that's just a personal reflection on on that aspect of it um but it's it definitely uh it definitely has a dark dimension uh and, and it it forces a, i think a contemplation of you know what are the underlying sort of you know what's the you know what how to put this exactly but how 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 deeply dark you know, can we go? And, uh, and if that's not separate from us, like if that's all fun- fundamentally real, right? That's something that happened, something that's happening even now. Then, and we just don't see it. We, we just don't happen to be there personally, but it's real, right? And it could happen. Then like, what, what kind of reality <laughs> includes people treating each other that way? Uh, so a- anyway, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, just tra- I'm just transitioning to join you guys through computer, but I'm looking forward to chiming in. This is great. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm at a loss for words, actually, on... Um, on on some of these you know, some of these events, so I should just shut up. <laughs> I, I I have to be. I'm I'm thinking a little bit of um, some of the Hindu deities, or particularly the you know Tibetan Buddhist deities that are um, you know full of fire, you know heads in bowls, you know drinking blood out of skull bowls, and you know the wrathful archetypes and 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 deities that they have and i kind of appreciate the fact that at least in that part of the world they include that in the divine spectrum Mm. um my experience with um violence has been brief and punctuated and none in the last you know 20 20 years or so approximately but it seems like i've had my share of uh fights and altercations and so my uh karma has been a little different this time around um i wasn't i wouldn't say i'm a i'm a fighter but i can relate to uh being in period places or periods of time where it seems like uh the challenge has been to uh um uh bring that fighter spirit in or the vicious spirit in especially when i lived in texas Texas will do that to you. <laughs> it better do that to you. I understand. <laughs> yeah, I actually um, l- left Texas. Um, I guess I was twenty-three, uh, um, and I knew I couldn't go back for at least seven years because of a fighting situation. <laughs> no. Yeah. So this is um, this is an interesting sidebar. Um, I felt. Um, the, the sort of, um, those portions of the plot that focused on 
male style conflict, you know, the visceral, the, the gritty, the, whether it was he against an institution or he against another man somehow, or, you know, further on in the book, you know, I mean, escalates on a global scale, um, were of some of the most provocative for me. And so, um, kind of neat just i mean for now the three of us you know in this particular circle it becomes a little bit of a a uh, you know a breakout group for a for for a men's circle somehow but um i've had i've had a very sort of um conflictive relationship with my own power uh, under conflict um i was always a smaller boy um growing up so there was a little bit of that i wasn't raised um I was raised by a mom for the early impressionable, like one through four or, you know, kind of transitioning into four or five or so. Um, so it's kind of an absent father in those first years. And um, a lot of my challenges has been around, you know, the gifts, but also the overbonding with the, with the feminine um, and, and, and um, some wounding around male energy. So um, my mom, just for context, my mom remarried a, a really great, uh, wonderful man who then, you know, I identify as my primary father who raised me. And he was, you know, unlike my Jewish intellectual, you know, um, genetic contributor, you know, I long for it to be more, but, um, you know, he, I guess that's a work in progress. Um, but the guy who came in was just sort of, you know, you know, hardworking from the farm, extremely loyal and fearless relative to how how you hold your own and how to raise a boy to hold his own etc and i was the the weakling teary-eyed you know city kid that he just sort of you know he'd never word it that way i'm just having fun with that but he got in the deal with this marriage and every attempt to try to school me and how to toughen me up a little bit you know just trying to teach me like i just remember specifically like well you don't throw a punch like you see in the movies big and round like that you know and then he rolled up a newspaper to show me you know that if you hit sideways it bends if you hit straight on it has all of this you know this driving strength or something and and literally you know knock the wind out of me showing me how much more powerful the straight punch would be you know so it never worked for the poor man and he only meant to you know prepare me for the world he knew but then again he you know it seems also it's possible that people who are ready to fight sometimes manifest you know um I don't know. Well, anyway, so the only point <laughs> relative to the, what this book was triggering, what the book triggers for me here is that um, watching his capacity to be so resolute that when, it, when there's a moment that calls for him to defend himself, just to see how total he's able to, to be in his conversion. Okay, now it's about, now it's going to come to this then I'm going to, I'm going to strike the first blow, do damage, whatever, you know, just the decisive, you know, ability rather than, so I don't, you know, and it wasn't, I, I just love, like, it wasn't, um, it doesn't present any sort of super, super macho vision of how that happens. There's an acknowledgement of fear, the taste of it in the mouth and the seeing of it in, in the eye of the other and the feeling, the, the stink of your own, you know, sweat, you know, as, as the animal body gets engaged. I mean, the further we get into it, the more, um, just the the paradoxical nature of, of carrying fear in a way that it doesn't get in the way of doing what you need to do to defend yourself or someone else or what have you. So um, for me, I guess the, the impression that I was left with at this point in the story, um, without sort of bringing too much into other chapters that we're not technically in yet, is that um, I longed, I, I remember, and I've been reminded again in the second read through, I'm I, I long to get a lesson from him in that. Was there something that can be given between men by telling a story or by sharing why it has to be this way or something that can sort of, you know, like a longing inside me to be able to be total if it's ever, if I'm ever called upon rather than to fold it. So, yeah. Hmm. Well, he's no Hamlet. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds like a line from Hamlet somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh i mean what's occurring to me reflecting on uh your um obs observations uh are is that uh in Li in lynn and in the other criminals right the uh, the others like Ab um, abdul i think was his name uh the palestinian 
uh, the the line between what certain worldview would call civilized and uncivilized, or, or not, you know, just natural and, uh, you know, like, like I don't know, to, <laughs> uh, normal, uh, you know, the, like the crazy line, like that is what is not really there. Like Lynn doesn't respect, doesn't view the, do, that's not his worldview. Like he, he's not inhibited uh, by the, by the, an ideal of civilization that, we, that would cut off uh, his ability to to act just as I mean just as any natural creature would act uh, who doesn't have to think about it <laughs> and uh, but at but in that moment because he does have he does have to think about it right he does have and I mean that's what the book is is like his thinking through his own choices and his own actions right um, and I guess. I guess I'm saying that I wonder, like, if, like, I don't know. I, I wonder whether, uh, like, I even know what that means. Like, what that, like, or, like, what it means to exist as just a pure violent being, you know, like a pure, like, defender and attacker uh, and, you know, to, like, totally strip away that that layer of civilizational kind of control and taming there's this essay that i'm going to read uh by peter sloterdijk who it, you know I'm re- the other book group is reading another book by his but it's called rules for the human zoo and one of the things he argues i might understand i haven't read the whole essay but my understanding from the summary uh, is that he he argues that what human beings have done is basically domesticated themselves. So we've become our own pets through our technologies and through our society and through like all the, uh, uh, you know, all the sort of developments of culture and civilization. We've, we've turned ourselves into pets. We've domesticated ourselves. Like, and Lynn is not undomesticated, you know, that, and I, and I'm domesticated. Like I'm a pet really of, of myself, you know, and, and, uh, this, you know, this kind of larger civil, civilizational construct, like this is my zoo, you know, this is where we live until, until there's a breakdown in it, like until there's a, a rift or a rupture in the structure surrounding us. And, you know, that happens when there's a war, when there's a crisis, when there's a natural disaster, you know, when there's conflict between groups. And I mean, I, I think that it's, it's actually, it's, you know, even though like in our own lives and where we are now, Colorado, Berkeley, you know, we're in relatively a safe environment. You know, we're not like on, at the nexus of, you know, these civiliza- civilizational conflicts like in the Middle East where, you know, we're, we're tying into millennia of bloodshed, revenge. Uh, the um, look, We're sort of distant from that in the context that we're, we're in, but that is just... The, those are just the conditions that happen to be prevailing for us now. They're not necessarily permanent. Uh, and so it's like, I find it like you, I find it actually useful, like as like a practical matter, like as a learning or educational matter to understand like the mind of a person like Lynn who can go there, who can be, uh, you know, can, can take the action that he needs to. Uh, you know, to the point of like, you know, biting people's faces and, you know, grabbing their balls, smashing their heads, you know, repeatedly, like really letting loose, <laughs> letting loose completely. Uh, and at the same time, be a noble and virtuous person in all these other regards and capable of love, capable of friendship, capable of thought. I mean, that, that's what's so amazing about this character is that he encompasses the ex- those extremes, and I mean b- b- both of those extremes are in in these chapters that we read, from you know his time in the prison to becoming a criminal to uh, becoming a, a student of and disciple of Kaderbai, and their sort of their philosophical um, yeah um, sort of discourses. Uh, so 
Yeah, I, I find it educational at the same time. I find it uh, uh, intimidating, I guess, you know, on one level, because like it invokes just the, you know, just the, the possibility that, you know, my reality doesn't have to be my reality. It could be a, a reality like any of these. And uh, if that's the case, then I, I have to be willing to embody them. And in some sense, I am embodying them, uh, like not personally in my particular incarnation. But I mean, if I'm truly not a separate self, right, if I truly am like this, a one self manifesting in infinite forms, then this is an aspect of myself. And so if it's an aspect of myself, then uh, it's something I think I need to learn about, you know, and uh, need to study. Uh, and that's part of what I feel like I'm, I'm in the process of. And it's, it's virtual, you know, it's like, I'm not out there getting my face bashed in by, but, uh, but thank good, thank goodness it's very virtual. Actually, I really wouldn't want to be. I mean, there, there's like you don't, you don't. I'm gonna say one more thing, and and it's a specific quote. Um, and I'm gonna find it for the benefit of grounding this conversation in literature. Uh, it's at the end of one of these chapters, and I have it in my notes, four seventy one. He said sooner, this is the very end of, of the chapter, the very end of chapter 22. And this is after he's talking to Ka- Khaled. Uh, no, let me, let me make sure I have his name right, too. Uh, yeah, Khaled, the Palestinian, who is, you know, who says that his hate has saved me. His family has been massacred uh, in this, um, uh, it was called the, I have this in the Shatila massacre uh, in, I, I think, Lebanon. Uh, I, wiki- I looked up the Wikipedia article about it, uh, and there's an interesting connection there because Shat- in the Wikipedia entry, it's Shatila and Sab- Sabra, which is the name, the name that has come up before. But he's reflecting on Khaled because Khaled has, like, has, chooses his hate. Like, he chooses it and embr- embraces it. And uh, Lynn says, sooner or later, fate puts us together with all the people, one by one, who show us what we could and shouldn't let ourselves become. Sooner or later, we meet the drunkard, the waster, the betrayer, the ruthless mind, and the hate-filled heart. But fate loads the dice, of course, because we usually find ourselves loving or pitying almost all of those people. And it's impossible to despise someone you honestly pity or to shun someone you truly love. And... um, in some ways, this is an introduction to a lot of, you know, all these possibilities of ourselves too, like who we would let ourselves become, who, we'd re- who we would aspire to be, who we would, uh, you know, not wish to become, to be. Uh, so I, 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 that kind of feels like a long rant, but uh, I mean, I'm glad we have this time to talk because these are all the sort of the, these like, reactions that kind of form as I'm reading and like in the unconscious between, you know, between, between reading times. And then even when I'm sleeping and dreaming, I go for walks and just things occur to me. And, and it's like the process, like we've been talking about of the book working on you, of it affecting you, of it really, of you taking it in, it, it uh, transforming your, your, um, your awareness in some way. <sighs> Yeah, so. Beautiful. Are we f- feeling inclined to use any of the the format from the last couple of times of like kind of chapter by chapter sort of thing? Does that feel cumbersome at all for folks? I, you know, it would be probably good to just do an overview, maybe not, not as in-depth in each chapter, but just the basics of what happened, right? Mm-hmm. It works for me. Well, we started at chapter 20. Yeah, Marco, lay, lay it out. I like your notes. Are you sure? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I keep thinking about doing these videos and self-consciousness and stuff <laughs> like that. And when I you know, go on a, rant, a riff, 
and uh, I get a little bit self-conscious about it. So <laughs> I, uh, but well, chap, uh, fuck it. Chapter 20 is, uh, <laughs> this is the Kalaba jail. This is after he's been picked up and this is the descent into, into the inferno, like where he describes the, the different layers of hell essentially uh, through each of the rooms. So you have the different abodes, the abode of, uh, of uh, the princes, the, the abode of Thebes, uh, the, uh, the, the abode of 40, uh, and uh, the, uh, the detection room was the last room. Uh, and so we go from the Kalaba jail uh, where he situates himself in the, amongst the abode of Thebes. Uh, we learn a little bit about his politics here because he, he doesn't want to, he could potentially just based on his physical prowess, right? Uh, occupy a space. Let's see each of the divisions of the, of the jail uh, have more and more people or more and more crowded or more and more fetid or more and more wretched. And depending on how much money or how much just raw power the prisoners have, they get sorted into these different levels. Now, so the first one is like a 10 by 10 room and has you know, seven or eight people in it. That, and then the den of the, the, den, <laughs> the abode of Thebes uh, has something like 12. Uh, and then the abode of 40 has 40 and it goes on like that. And as you get to the back of the prison, you get closer to the, to the lat- latrine, which is an open sewer. And it's like ankle deep of shit and piss. And there are people that are stuck there but that's where they've kind of gotten pushed. They have to, they live there and die there. Uh, literally like in, uh, in, uh, you know, a, a pool of human fe- feces waste. Um, but that's his uh, introduction to the uh, prison system uh, from which he's uh, shuttled off to Arthur road prison. And uh, this is where he goes through the gauntlet. He meets the, um, the uh, overseers, the convict overseers, uh, and uh, gets into some, um, uh, makes a mistake there. Do you remember this? Uh, he's invited to be an overseer at first, and uh, partly because of his, you know, because of his, I, I think maybe even hatred for the system or for authority, uh, he refuses but that puts him at odds from, from the get-go. And he's a target anyway, because he's been singled out. He's been put there by somebody uh, who we, we, haven't, we don't know yet. We have perhaps our suspicions. Um, so, yeah, this is chapter 20. I, I, uh, uh, the lesson seems to be do not retaliate <laughs> against uh, your overseers, uh, because in this place, uh, you will pay a very heavy price uh, for even the slightest disobedience. Uh, to the to the order and and the hierarchy and the the raw exertion of power is that is that absolute here? What what uh, the, I did take notes, so I'm 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 reading from the, from those, and I have um, uh, those. Are, that's what jumped out at me. And if we're gonna uh, that, that's probably a little more detailed than we should go in for each chapter, but that's great. Uh, yeah. Uh, Uh, would you like to add anything to to that description, or I mean, do, we, do should we respond to anything in particular there, or just kind of move on and then go go more meta, or um, what can we do? I guess I feel like I have a license to jump in if there's something that I'm hearing that I want to either elaborate on or something that I've read or, or whatever I say, Oh, I don't want to kind of skip past this part, but so far you're doing just great Marco, that whole sense of his integrity or his pride or his politics. And we're sort of getting that. That's interesting how it's getting fleshed out in these deplorable, you know, um, hell holes, right? There's certain aspects of, of, um, Lynn's character, um, uh, his his philosophy and his politics, if you will, that put him at odds, but he embodies it in in the in the most direct way, right? And and it and yep. he it's like he can't go against his own truth or integrity, and it he certainly pays for it. The code, mm. yeah, yeah, totally. That was um, it was just 
exactly what I was going to address. Uh, he does a beautiful job of leading us into, um, I mean, it, it's this amazing trick. I've been trying to break it down just from the standpoint of appreciating good writing. We're being told a story. So in a sense, there's like straight narration, you know, happening where, you know, we're being oriented to a place and then we're being told subtleties about the place, et cetera. But we're also, there's this, there's this sort of, um, the, the, the other level that, that that plays with is that the person telling us about it is the person who was there. And so it's a very odd, if you were listening to someone um, like a professor in a college course tell you, you know, from a definitive standpoint, what kind of the conditions are of an Indian prison, there would be a certain um, um, almost like, like um, safe dissociation, you know, kind of like an aseptic conceptual, whatever. But the man who's sharing with you is like confiding in you. And I feel like the same way that if you were sitting across a table in a cafe with him and he was laying this on you as his own experience, you'd, I mean, not, not just like leaning in, but you'd be, you know, you'd, you'd, you know, be like all this empathy, like going, going back and forth, you know, between the two of you for appreciating his plight and oh my God. And then, and then also how much deeper, of what he says about how it is becomes true. So there's a bit of almost feeling like you're being drawn into or initiated into the code because it was, you, you see that in some moments he was willing to fight to, to gain, you know, he knew, he knew the rule and where he would have to show muscle. And in another moment, he was not willing to submit at all, like running the gauntlet with that level of steely, you know, self-control and, and, um, and also not being willing to become sort of the, 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 the bitch of the, you know, the higher ups and taking a more comfy spot. And, you know, so in, in any case, I was drawn to that dynamic as well, Paul. Uh, absolutely. Amazing. And then of course, you know, I, I don't, I hope over the course of, you know, our time together, I don't over rely on my India anecdotes and, and all that, but there's, um, yeah, to me, it was very different being sick in India or being in sickening situations because there was altogether a, um, an opening up and a readjustment to, to what would be by Western standards, you know, fairly, you know, insults to senses and, and um, sort of propriety and boundaries. And I mean, it's just like, I mean, it, travel itself, you know, is, is certainly, you know, mind altering, but there's a few, particular destinations that that are really you know that are really the heavy dose and so already having adjusted to india and sort of proud that i had become comfortable with then for example to get sick in india um was a whole new thing and and then you know so or traveling in the trains and and all of that so um yeah some experiences of of local jails from the from the outside uh uh India, Southeast Asia. In Southeast Asia, I spent time visiting prisoners in Thai prisons as part of um, part of just a, a, a volunteering thing that that one can do when one is there. But this really just brought all that back up for me again. And so it, again, this this chat, these this block of reading was a uh, was an initiation into a new level of uh, of uh, of uh, well, the raw penetrating uh, power of this particular story. I'd say, please don't be shy about sharing your own anecdotes or versions. It's, I think, partially what's immensely enriching about reading this with you, David, is that mm. you have direct experience and from such a early age. And, mm. you know, now I get to find out that you've visited Thai prisons as a volunteer. And it's like <laughs> some part of me could say, okay, well, we've got the whole rest of the night, right? Let's just, you know. <laughs> well, that's so, sweet. so, yeah. Thank you. Don't, don't, good don't reality check. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I, I, I would be quick to just chime in if I made that um, um, Marco, uh, without going at it directly through things he has said, has done a beautiful job, I think, of illuminating the uh, kind of transcending the boundary of reading um, as if it's sort of this, you know, like an entertainment process or it's, it's um, somehow not fully tangential to an experiential um, um, event or something but i think you know he's done a good job of evoking kind of the orphic the the transformational and the, the living nature of a story as it starts to be welcomed especially at the level that we're we're attempting to support each other to keep to welcome this so um yeah uh i i 
wanted to, you know, just kind of reality check that me doing that again and again, isn't just, it's like going from fireside chat storytelling to, oh, well on YouTube, you know, there's just, it can be something I was worried that it could be overdone, like bringing, yeah, well, in my experience, reality of India, you know, so thank you, uh, you know. Ah, yeah, I, 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 I'm glad that we're bringing all of our perspectives onto the table. I mean, we're kind of spilling our guts a little bit and that's sort of, this is an elegant spilling of guts, this book. And I think it's well inviting us to do a little bit of the same thing. Uh, and so I, um, I think I'm, it's very valuable to, for me to hear your visceral <laughs> uh, responses and reactions, like what actually feels relevant. And the personal side, I think, how can it not be personal? I mean, that's the, the, uh, that's the, um, like, I, I think that's what the book like drives in, in is how fundamentally personal it always be, becomes. Right. And, yeah. um, and, and so I th- what's special about this book I think, is that it doesn't dwell to, it goes to the, the cerebral uh, and it is, it's perfectly fluent in the philosophical that chapter with Katerbai, like I was saying at the beginning of the call, we could spend all day just talking about his cosmology and uh, like this very sophisticated uh, evolutionary metaphysics that he has and how he, uh, how he derives a a moral code from it. Uh, And then, and then how he actually applies that moral code to his criminal enterprise and why he sees some activities as acceptable and other activity activities as unacceptable. Um, so I, I, like, I'm, I'm so glad that he can go there and we can go there. Uh, and at the same time that, uh, the visceral is, is communicated so directly. And I mean, beautifully, like in the, like you're saying, David, in the literary sense, the, the writing is so good. Uh, and so vivid, like it really accomplishes like what writing is intended to do. Uh, yeah. And the feeling that it's lived gives it to me almost like, it's like, I'm not, uh, like I'm biting into something like that's just so real, like it fresh from the, the, the tree or fresh out of the ground or something like that. Like it's like full of blood <laughs> that, you know, just bursts in my mouth. It's like, there's no uh, mistaking the, uh, um, authenticity <laughs> if you will of of the of the material um so uh you know i like to i, I like to really get into it like I, I really like to get into the to the space of the book and to read the passages and reread something that i like and i mark up my book and okay. take notes and um like i uh my, i honestly feel like there there's so much it, so, so much to learn right mm. from uh, a work like this and that this a book like this accomplishes not only an artistic task uh, but also a um an educational one right mm. that like part of I mean, we talked we, I feel like we talked here maybe in another conversation about life being like a school mm. and how uh, Terry Patton talks about this as well, uh, but how, you know, if if you frame it that way, and and maybe if it just frames itself to you that way, you really could see like these episodes and these encounters and even the beatings that that you may take. And maybe for us, it's not like you know, neither not, we've not been personally tortured in the way that this character has. But life has its beatings in one way or another, on one level or another. It has its way of um, reacting you know, and act <laughs> in this equal and opposite manner of uh, of the way that karma, I guess, works. Uh, and so, um, I guess, I mean, I I, I end up again like just like wanting to 
Ryan, to spend more time unfurling and understanding like what we actually have, like when we, we spill our guts and when we, you know, feel like moved by something that we read, why, why is it moving us? Like what's really that about? Uh, and uh, I mean, I have some questions even uh, we can, I, uh, we could probably, we can go on to the other chapters, but just to maybe see the question, but before we do, um, we, and, and, and even to anticipate where we might end up, because the last chapter that we read is, is Lindley leaving Carla, leaving her. So he, he, he had, like, where we left off last week, remember, he had paradise. Like, he'd entered the gates of, you know, the gates of heaven had opened up. He had made love to Carla. Uh, he'd, like, they had consummated this, this romance that had been just brewing in this, this dark cauldron of, of their emotional lives in, in mom and bombay for the you know for the previous couple of years and then from there to the prison now we've come full circle and although he's returned back to bombay and she's gone he's able to find out where she is he goes out and finds her and they have what 10 days or something of um union and then he leaves and why my question would be why what is like that about what is What's really, what's really driving him? What's really moving him? And, uh, and then what's moving us? You know, that, so um, should we move on maybe to chapter 21? I'd like to let you guys, if, if you want to take a, a stab at it, because this is the pr- prison uh, s- chapter, uh, co- specifically the um, uh, Arthur Road prison. Uh, so, you know, this, there's, I have my notes, but uh, I'm yeah. sh- sure you re- remember the salient details. Because All you feel different. inclined? I'm, I just made a few notes. So, you yeah, know, please. just there was that, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the initiatory beating the gauntlet, right? And um, I definitely went over that a couple times just to make sure I was reading what I was reading about how he chose to kind of walk the slow walk rather than, you know, buckle and run or whatever. And then it was uh, the scene with Rahim, the driver um, from that uh, scene where he um, uh, was trying to rescue the, the Nigerians and uh, from the, the car accident. And we, because Rahim had stood up to the overseers, um, there was a brutal scene of him having his arms broken. And um, then we, you know, we're being drawn into the, the, the horror of the lice and the the daily routines, right, that they have to go through just to, you know, keep themselves barely clean and barely fed. Um, And these moments, and he doesn't overly dwell on them, but you get the sense of the men singing together, you know, at night and talking about how Indian men sing. Now, there's one little comment there. I keep noticing how certain qualities of Indian men seem to have such a full spectrum, different from maybe some of people I'm here with in the United States is Indian men seem to be able to sing and dance and play and love and bring forth a lot of um, uh, expressiveness and and color. And then on the other side, we have these, these very macho intense qualities, right? They're sort of very full spectrum anyway. Hmm. Um, And uh, then he tries to get his message out to um, Kadarbai and the two men, um, are are caught carrying the message and brought back beaten. He feels, you know, bad about that. And um, it comes clear that nobody is to help the gore. There's some sort of big conspiracy going on, right? That uh, he's there on purpose. And um, then he ends up with that fight with the big Rahul, the, the um, overseer who sort of singled him out for special attention. And he uh, goes, goes nuts and, and uh, he's fighting so fiercely in a corner that the rest of the overseers decide instead of trying to take him on, they bring in groups of 10 men at a time, 10 other prisoners and beat them until finally with the third group, uh, Lynn uh, gives in, drops his arm. And then we have the horrible you know, next level of the beating, um, which because they beat him so bad, they probably also save him because they decide to bathe him, you know, and soap him down. And um, there's the um, brother of the fellow that who he'd gotten in a fight with who sent to kill Lynn. 
And um, uh, so that's another scene, right, of this, despite Lynn being just, you know, near death, he's able to... Starving, mind you, too, right? Starving. Or, yeah. Oh, my gosh, right? And then, yeah. um, you know, fight off this, this, this guy yet again. Um, and then we get that, that, that um, the rescue with Vikram using Cotter by his money. And, uh, and then, and then the scene, the sense that there's, you know, the whole transaction and, and the, the corruption. Um, and here, I'll, since I'm talking, I'll take another chance. It seems to me that most of the police and authority figures in the government seem like s- slimy, stupid idiots and the criminals are philosophical and wise, <laughs> you <laughs> That's know, a really good observation. Yeah. <laughs> right. So any, anything else you guys noticed there? No, I covered it for me pretty pretty well in terms of the, the bones of, you know, kind of the, the events, for sure. Yeah, I'm looking at my own notes, and uh, um, he gives some rules for street fighting. Those were interesting. Yeah. Uh, I don't, we don't need to review them, uh, but uh, uh, we've, and we end up back in Bombay. Right. And uh, he comes back and discovers that Carla has gone and he's about to start working for, for Cotter by. Uh, and they were, are about to let him have some time to rest and recover. And he says, no, let's get like, let's get to work. Yeah. Uh, and his, his mantra or the, yeah, what would he, the statement that he lands on is never again. So never again, like he, he's not going to let that happen to, his, to him again is what he says. And there's, I think, that statement is indicating the hardness, like the, the some kind of hardening that uh, <laughs> has occurred uh, in you know, through his experiences in the prison system. Uh, and um, I remember one point back in chapter twenty when he's in the Kolaba jail and the men there are starving, and he's and he sees the hunger in their face because they don't all get their own aluminum pan- plate to get food. Uh, so they have to share it amongst themselves, uh, and the the, mo- the lowest, you know, the men lowest in the pecking order may may not get food, uh, and the hunger in their eyes, and how he can't forget that, how it, it it's not something that he he can he can process, and uh, and so I think he's now in this hard place, and he's about to m- move in the next chapter. He's about to undergo this transition in the next chapter uh, from becoming a person who commits crimes to becoming what he calls a criminal. So it makes an ontological <clears throat> leap to a new order of, of, of being. And now he's going to learn the criminal arts uh, in the, in the subsequent chapter. Uh, yeah. And I, I would invite you, you know, you, Paul, you again, or uh, David, if you'd like to, to, to uh, go over the particular uh, events here. Uh, there's a couple of things that happen. I think it's sort of just transitioning yeah. to uh, to what happens later with um, with Kaderby and, and Carla. But yeah, uh, Chap- here he, here he's working for Kaderby, and so we start learning about that. Right, and I love the um, so so 22. Um, yeah, I, again, yeah, this distinction about you no, know, really he's moving to a new a new level, working for you know the uh the the illicit side of 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 life and but this is it just it starts to take on this kind of classiness as well this like paul was saying you know we're getting introduced to another one of the 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 noble criminals or something that khaled ansari uh becomes his teacher right learning about um you know how currencies work and i you know even as a a person with you know like a like historically a day job in in that domain you know um market management and and fund management and things like that and um i found it i just found it beautiful uh, insightful interesting it works on a whole bunch of levels but um he takes he he draws him draws him in in a way that really touches the details but really leads us all into an appreciation of where where the difference comes from where where is there and why is there a a market that's formed between the difference in currencies and i don't know if it's just me personally you know because i i have my head in that space anyway um or whether other people found that interesting but that was um a beautiful way to kind of enter this chapter um 
the um you know there was there was a wasn't there there was like a side story going on um we get back into leopold's again and so um there's you know the there's a wooing process still going on with with um parvati and johnny cigar is falling in love with sita and there's all that kind of fun stuff but i think there was like kind of a uh you know this is like a a a, a a strand running through kind of the core of, of the plot weave right now that DDA lays on him a, a, a first major clue and how he, how he was set up and he, he drops this little um, curious bomb, you know, it was a woman, you know, we don't know more than that, but now who is it? You know, what women do we know? And we've, uh, you know, we're, we're given enough juicy, you know, enough information to make it, kind of like at least I found it really engaging my curiosity and running scenarios in all of that. But um oh hold I'm on getting... a second. Wait are, is it not I mean I, I keep thinking Madame Zhao. Uh, uh-huh. and I that just seems to me the most obvious candidate. But mm. uh, particularly because there was that scene just before he gets picked up uh, right. when Madame Zhao's uh, eunuch spots that scene. Him. Right. So uh, uh, whether or not that's how it turns out, uh, I'll just lay put my cards on the table. That's my bet. Some her or somebody connected uh, to her, but uh, I'll, I'll we'll see. You know, time will tell. Right. Oh my <laughs> gosh, my fan, my I love going to movies, but other people hate going with me because I'm always guessing the plot. Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> my my once upon a wife used to cover my ears watching trailers because she says you're going to guess the plot ahead of time because <laughs> I, I have some part of me that loves to figure out the strategies so yeah yes. I'm, i've had all kinds of thoughts um and i'm with you though it seems to point to madam madam Zhao. that's great so i um um for, forgetting that i know the answer i remember kind of the few directions I was going. And one of them was that I thought that this might also all be a little bit of a test um, from Cutter by uh, somehow testing him because it felt like he was on the verge of entering that world. And well, I, anyway, um, so I thought mm-hmm. he might've used one of the women that he seems to have some control with um, Anyway, so yeah, that would be quite diabolical. <laughs> that would be quite diabolical. Maybe too early for him to to turn that. I, I have a feeling we're gonna we're gonna get him up on a pedestal a little higher before he gets knocked down. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm also a gonna, I I got a little ahead of myself because I remember also enjoying the reveal around that the that the police in the prison had 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 um, figured out the whole Australian connection that he was wanted. And so, um, you know, it would be it would be painless for them to, you know, uh, there also would be a route of bakshish or payola trying to slowly arrange giving them up to this international source who'd be happy to pay for the privilege of, you know, um, that handoff. But that it was Lynn, it was that beautiful um, storytelling around, um, you know, um, that the... Um, that the Indians, the, the Indians love, love, um, love, love, and they love a good story and they love loyalty. And it's, you know, and so Lynn's work in the, in the ghetto um, had um, in the slum had sort of endeared him in, in the story of him to the police, which had then made a difference for their willingness to not just hand them over. They still wanted bakshish, of course, but, you know, and, and that, that was, that was worked out, but, um, but that, you know, it, anyway, there was a sweet kind of reveal about Indian psychology, even in bureaucracy and, and how um, Lynn's um, authentic, you know, merging with the culture and genuine service had somehow um, worked some magic relative to him not, you know, going that, that darkest of routes all the way back to Australia. So, so that was another piece. Um, Vic, Vikram tells the story, tells him the story of the cops, how they, they came around to the slum, right. And mm-hmm. they asked after him and they, they heard about, you know, the good works that he had done and so forth. And then it's, and then he says, it's about the heart. He says, this is not England or New Zealand or the Australia heart. or wherever the fuck else. This is India, man. This is India. This is the land of the heart. This is where the heart is the king, man. The exactly. fucking heart. That's why you're. Yeah. And uh, good. Yeah. 200 fucking languages and a billion people. India is the heart. It's the mm. heart that keeps us together. Nice. People like my people, then. Yeah. 
Exactly. I think, yeah. So that's, uh, that was good. The only other uh, piece um, from a chronology standpoint of that chapter was, of course, this amazing um, period of time where, where in, in, Indira Gandhi was assassinated and the whole tension between the Sikhs and, and uh, the Hindus. And, and so um, that was set a very sort of ominous. There was a lot of kind of exchanges about how ominous it was. And remember, you know, kind of used to, you know, DDA had some things to say about it and what this could mean. And, and, and uh, so anyway, that was some um, that Lynn had some, he, what did he call it? He, he said it was a toxic force, um, hatred. They got into this whole, Lynn and, Khaled, Lynn and, and Khaled got into this whole exchange about hatred, which was super interesting. And Lynn was just saying it was a toxic force. And, and um, yeah, which, which Khaled then of course has his own you know deep personal story for, his own relationship with hatred. And so anyway, that was the, the other piece in the chapter. I was really glad that, um, that the author and through Lynn was able to convey how uh, important she was. I think they called her she, right? The Indira mm -hmm. Gandhi. And I remember, you know, hearing about it when I was younger at the time that it happened, but uh, the impact of that on the on the whole country, the society, um, you know, um, having her killed in in the way that she was by her Sikh bodyguards, and how how um, you know deeply momentous that that was. What a what a complete change in everything. Um, and also, the you mentioned earlier the education. I have noticed that I'm looking up. Um, you know, what were those called? Cod malls, you know, the uh -huh. turn out to be bed bugs, you know, or yeah, going and yeah, right. And, and then the, um, uh, the, the massacres, worms, you know. the worms, like all these things, like really going into, you know, looking up where's, uh, these places go, uh, you know, and trying to get a sense of it. So I, it's, it's actually driving me to, um, explore and educate myself just to go along even more deeply in the book. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And, and the currency piece or the crime piece is like it was such a relief mm. after the prison just to get up into that space and just be learning about that. It was like, thank heavens. Right. Totally. Yeah. Um, I mean, a few dif different things there. I mean, Khaled is really an intellectual, right? I mean, he, he studied in New York. He fell in love with a Jewish girl there. Uh, and he uh, written a paper um, uh, a kind of uh, scholarship, a scholarly paper on uh, ancient trade routes, uh, something like that. It was called Black Babylon was the name of the, the thesis that he, that he wrote, uh, mm -hmm. which didn't end up getting published. Uh, and then, I mean, the, the, the event, the historical event that we learn about, or that's referenced in this chapter, in addition to, the, uh, to Indira Gandhi's assassination, uh, and I went and looked this up too. I, I, I wikipedia uh, it is the called the Sabra and Shatila massacre. Uh, and I didn't really know about this event. I knew in general about uh, the conflicts in Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, you know, at that time, because there was the, uh, the U S Marines were um, uh, you know, driven out of Lebanon at one point, I think, I don't know if it was before or after this, but these are all, you know, interconnected events in this long running conflict. But so this Sabra and Shatila massacre, uh, of course, really occurred. But what occurred to what, what I noticed is, is the is that uh, the word Sabra, uh, because that's the name, isn't it, of the uh, individual or the group that uh, that Carla and Katabai are also afraid of. So I'm wondering if there's some connection between uh, the that you know those events uh, in Palestine and uh the comp the the, the um ri rivalry or the danger you know that is present in bombay um yeah i it's uh it, it's it's you know I, I for a while too i mean here's one area like where i feel like i'm learning i saw india is pretty separate from what we call the middle east and what you see in these chapters is that it's sort of like just a cooler zone of the same conflicts. Like it's sort of a, 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 a kind of step removed 
but but the, there's a circulation between the workers who are working in um, I think it was uh, Abu Dhabi or various other you know countries who then circulate back to Bombay. That's part of the black market uh, exchange because they bring back gold. So uh, and they also have a, a racket uh, involving like their money changing from you know the the local currencies to to rupees. So it, it's all interconnected and interwoven with this like hotbed of um, factional and tribal uh, conflicts, and it's a, it's been um, it's been really interesting to learn about uh, about that uh, and, and you know, going more more into depth. Um, so so should we move on to the next chapter then? Like well, we're almost we're almost there. We're at Kaderbai's philosophy, chapter twenty three, and I, I don't know if we want to tackle this, but uh, and we talked a little bit about it. I'm curious what what you all think uh, about his overall sort of theory of um, how you ground a morality uh, in a way that's objective. That you know be, uh, the he and uh, Lynn get into this conversation and Lynn is sort of like the student and is asking good questions uh, and sort of pushing Kaderbaya to deeper explanations for, for things. Uh, but the basic issue is good and evil, it seems. And how do you determine what is good and what's evil? And Kaderbaya gives his explanation for it based on this cosmic evolutionary uh, cosmology. Uh, so, and even a theory of science, like a theory of like how we know and how, what we know, uh, and how good that is. Uh, but I'm curious, what, what were your responses to it? This was, like I said, this was a fantastic chapter and to your point, Paul, also a relief from the, uh, uh, the graphic violence and the like criminal, um, you know, uh, entanglements of the previous chapters. I just want to mention something. I'm sure, David, you're going to have a lot of interesting things to say about that, the philosophy. But one of the things that I'm noticing is the, the contrast between our visceral animal nature, that what we've inherited as, as, you know, human animals, and yet are also our capacity for, you know, conceptualization and philosophy. And it just, they're just right on top of each other. And then the sense of the love and the betrayal, I mean, he, the juxtapositions are beautiful and immediate and somewhat cinematic. Um, but I just am really appreciating being taken in, you know, from the hell realm to, you know, uh, the cosmological. And I'm, I, I've uh, enjoyed how he's done that just so seamlessly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I was particularly taken by the section of their exchange and I'm just leafing through uh, on the side here, my, 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 my book, um, trying to get back to it, but it was that whole quintessential tension point around, um, you, you remember when like Cotter slows down, I'm not trying to trap you Lynn or trick you, but you will agree. I think from this example that it's possible to do the wrong thing for the right reason and this whole oh you know and, and the way that it like drove lynn a little bit nuts like his certainty you know it's like he was fascinated by him and also like rebellious it made me curious like his relationship with his father how you know what this was triggering for him he's so drawn to cut by and also has this push and pull thing with cut her by so you know sort of you, you know is, uh, by like the con he saved him not just from the Indian prison he makes this point but also from the Australian Australian prison because uh, if Kadabai is not responsible initially for putting him there as you intimated he, he might be um, or at least theorized at one point that he that he was um, then uh, then he saved him like he saved him on these two levels and so Lynn is in his debt right on um, very profoundly also, Lin is kind of in his spell of protection. He, he's put, he's put, Kadabai has put Lin into his circle of protection. He's given him this gold or the, this gold amulet or something with his name inscribed on the back 
in Urdu, English, and uh, Hindi. And if he's ever in trouble, all he has to do is show this this amulet, and that should protect him because nobody would, you know, want to fuck with Kadarbai, right? So um, it's this. It is it is this push and pull because on the one hand he has this vast and profound and mature philosophical uh, outlook and and even a a, a moral sort of uh, credibility or, or, or authority authority he, he exudes authority right um, but on the other right. hand uh, Lin is co- somewhat compromised in relation to him uh, and not just kind of from the criminal, not not just from the social perspective, but also from the inner psychological perspective, because he he he, he needs that that father, uh, you know, energy or the father archetype or that father figure, uh, in you know, to f- for some he needs it for something like he needs it for something deep and personal for him to himself, and I mean to to maybe come back to the, to the question I, I, asked, I asked earlier, what's really driving him or what's he really about or why does he leave Carla? Like, why is he, um, like, why, why is he so, in ten, enwrapped in this drama now with Kaderbai? Um, I still don't know. I mean, it's a little bit, opa- it's op- opaque to me. I know that there's something there, but it's like in the d- dark depths of, you know, the unconscious or the not yet revealed uh, of, of the story. Uh, and so, David, when you were talking about the push and pull and like what the, that tension or drama is, um, it's it's a uh, it seems very it seems like a very profound driver to like to to the to the story and the events that unfold and kind of like is keep keeping the story going because like at the end of this in the last chapter, may, maybe he could have stayed with Carla and lived happily ever after. It seemed to be like that was the option. Like they could live in Goa on the beach. I mean, it's wonderful. Uh, and something makes him not choose that, right? Um, and I, I'm, I don't know exactly what that is. I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm curious for him. And uh, I don't know, it's one of the kind of mysteries in this. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, I'm the the exchange between the two of them in in that happened here really um was something i kept coming back to as new as sort of the rise and fall of the plot flow brought moments of of um these issues around good and evil um really to the fore and watching him struggle and grapple and even um even try on and, and throw off and try on again what Cutterby was telling him, like Cutterby, Cutterby's view of good and evil and how the uni- how how the universe is functioning. This idea, you know, that it's a journey from you know absolute you know unity or sim- simplicity through you know ever um, ever greater levels of complexification, and that you know anything that essentially serves that 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 journey uh you know serves complexity in a sense can be can be you know said to be good and anything that that attempts to obstruct it or deny it or work against it can be said to be bad and so um it'll it'll um i think we're gonna i think the richer there's gonna be some richer returns to there'll be um rich returns to this topic in light of new um plot moments as we get further into the story. And so at, at this early stage, there's not a, a ton more that I would say about it, but I, I really liked, <laughs> I really liked the depth that this brought in at this stage in the book. Cause it gave me a couple kind of interesting lenses through which to view, you know, the unfolding of his fate and, and the, the, the intertwined fates of, of this amazing sort of diverse, rich group of, of people. So. You're playing the same role as Kaderbai uh, here. <laughs> Where he ends up with Lynn. When Lynn says, okay, who judges what's good? And like, given this whole, whole framework, mm-hmm. which I think we should note is sort of, uh, reminds me of T- Taylor de Chardin, Omega point theory, uh, yeah. a little bit of Whiteheadian process philosophy. I mean, there's mm-hmm. this, uh, you know, advanced, sophisticated um, you know, philosophy in, in here. Uh, but 
Uh, but that's where he leaves him. He, he says, well, that's, that's a question I'll answer for you at another time. <laughs> yeah. And it's so funny that you said that. Cause I thought of whitehead, this, um, this idea that, you know, I'm um, true enough, you know, you didn't, mm. didn't totally drive ourselves crazy, you know, in some sort of, you know, German existentialist, you know, navel gazing, but like true enough. I mean, Cutter by seems to have, have found a model that for him, gives him incredible um, um, consistency onto himself to li- to act in a very undivided or whole way, you know, and yet it doesn't, you know, it, it wouldn't be that you'd have to grind him down to, you know, like, you know, in the courtroom of, you know, clinical examination, he could defend the, you know, the quantum physics of all of it, but he seems to be a generalist, who has, you know, through this, you know, through this apprenticeship with the physicist has sort of found these building blocks that put together a a world upon which he could build an empire, you know, doing good with money that came from, from doing conventionally speaking, illicit or, or bad, what we would think of as bad things, but no. And then he also has his boundaries to things that he won't do. And, you know, so anyway, intriguing and, and really engaging. Remind me a little bit of uh, Don Corleone because you know the, a little the bit of what? Don Corleone, the guy in The Godfather. Yes, uh, yes because yes. you know bef- they had their own standards, you know, for for the kinds of crime they would they weren't they they wouldn't do drugs and he he wouldn't do uh, I think Carabao, I don't remember Corleone, but Carabao won't they, they don't do drugs and prostitution. So there's a certain nobility, you know, to this uh, class of criminal, um, and. You've frozen up, or I've frozen up. Oh, there you are. Cool. Um, anyway, Paul, uh, we're kind of nearing, I think, the end of this. Uh, but I'd love to hear uh, your, your reflections, and then maybe we just touch on Carla uh, and this, this scene at the end uh, before we wrap up. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, that scene at the um, end with with Carla, I um, couldn't help but think a little bit about um, uh, the the themes of masculinity, and then we talked a bit about that as well. And um, I remember a book that um, a fellow named Sam Keen had written. He was big in the men's movement once upon a time with Robert Bly, called um, "Fire in the Belly," and in it he describes something that he said he learned from his mentor about what it means to be a man and two important things. One is to know where you're going and who you're going with. And if you get those out of order, you're fucked. And so maybe, and so it's like, you know, there's a certain sense of as defining his own self or finding his manhood or finding, you know, both in relationship, obviously with whom he now recognizes as a father figure, whom he's, you know, taking the imprint from and all that, that uh, something incredibly important about him becoming who he needs to be for himself, that seems to enable him to, or force him rather, to leave Carla. And uh, of course, sitting here where I am at, at this stage in my life, I think, no, love is more important. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, despite my, uh, you know what I think. Um, in fact, of my romantic idealism being more or less in a in a in a coma, um, I really, you know, like you said, just said, no wait. I, if the book ended here, I think I could sort of sleep okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't go happily ever after. Some part of me wants that, but yeah. can I do just a quick quick technology check? Am, am I current? Are you guys hearing me? Yeah, you, you disappeared, kind of flickered off and froze for a little while, Go, but you seem gotcha. to be back now. Could you, yeah. um, could you guys stop and restart your video just for a moment in case that makes a difference for me? For some reason, it, it's um, lower left-hand corner, corner, the little video camera icon. Yeah, I just did. I'm not seeing you guys in current motion right now. It's just sort of frozen. Hmm. Try it again. Yep. Now you guys are coming back. Yeah. Yep. Appreciate that. Perfect. Well, I, I think, uh, I think Lynn knows who he's going with, but he doesn't know where he's going. I think, <laughs> uh, and that, that seems to be the, the problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, Did I, from hearing Paul, what Paul last shared, 
did we um, in that little gap where I wasn't present? Have we transitioned now to to Goa? Is that are we there in our conversation? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Okay. Uh, yeah, Paul Paul picked picked it up and uh, uh, cool. mentioned fire in the belly, but uh, and this idea which I just uh, reiterated uh, that you know uh, that as a man you have to know you where you're going when you say and who you're going with and if you get those in the wrong order you're fucked uh yep. and it seemed like that uh would be applicable in this case uh but yep. uh we're 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 about just about 90 minutes so i thought we we could wrap it up on this particular scene and yeah i yeah <laughs> i wish that I, I i i want the romantic ending too <laughs> <laughs> i wish that he would have stayed uh right. but there's still a few hundred pages to go. <laughs> so. I um I lived um I lived in Goa and where he found her, um I had lived in a a very uh, funky community of people. We inhabited a, a massive banyan tree, which as and you guys may very well know, they grow in a lot of different places, but they can span you know long areas. They essentially you know shoot out. They from from the branches, um, uh, these vines, vine like um, creepers that are actually trying to reroot shoot out. They eventually touch the ground. They get thick as the trunk, and and it, it takes a biologist to, or a botanist to actually come and tell you where the origin point was as it spreads over time. And so, in any case, he found her. It was just very. I remember it moved me a lot. He found her in Anjuna Beach, and if you ever. Google Anjuna Beach and Banyan trees, you'll start to see sort of the, the place that I would run away to when, when things were getting a little too hot at the ashram in, uh, in Bombay. So there was, you know, there was all kinds of very rich memories as he's, you know, renting motorcycles and cruising, cruising that, uh, that, you know, Panjam and, and uh, uh, Arunjala. There's a number of beaches in the whole row there and he's kind of looking for her everywhere. And I, I can literally smell the, you know, the, the morning roti cooking, you know, where I'd wander up for, for, uh, you know, for chai and, and roti and whatever along this road and the dust of a motorcycle coming by. And then he's riding one looking for her and I'm kind of back there. I, he didn't, he really missed a wonderful little uh, gem, which certainly wasn't lost on him or, or did he miss it? No, no, no. He mentioned it, didn't he? Cause you know, the, 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 the Goa bathroom technology is just incredible. Oh. Yeah. That's a real deal. I mean, you just, you barely walk into town without having four or five of these amazing wild pigs following you around, just waiting for you to, to make, make your motions as, as Prabhaka would, would put it. So, but in any case, yeah, very, very rich and, uh, um, and spent some amazing, I, 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 when I was in India, I fell in love with a, a woman also from the States, but I met her there. Um, we did our vacation in Goa, it was, you know, short of, uh, you know, a week of, you know, 105 fever for me, um, uh, uh, having decided that for some reason it was smarter to eat opium than smoke it. Um, I, I, it was a romantic uh, place for, for us and we bonded there and stayed together for over a decade thereafter. So, you know, uh, a bit of, you know, reading the the love that unfolded there, and then the heartbreak of that, and uh, anyway, it's very evocative uh, turn of events for him to go go there, and then not have it work out longer term with Carla again. You know, just like ah. Oh. One little piece too, I noticed that the connection with is it Ola? Is that how we're saying her name, Ola? And um, how that lead and his suspicion. You know, because we know that it was a woman who set him up. And so, um, and then he sets her up with Lisa. And so we have these, these women, you know, these, uh, you know, uh, women who all seem to be quite beautiful, um, all seem to be, have, have been involved in, you know, um, relatively uh, interesting criminal activities or with the men. And uh, so just the fact that they bring that, in as well and a little bit more with the um the the love with uh johnny cigar and Prabhakar parvati sita and all that um twice he goes back twice he leaves carla to meet up with ula which that this is odd you know it's like fool me once uh shame on you but um and 
Yeah, that's that that almost is implausible to me. I have to say, uh, like, uh, not knowing, of course, what's to come, uh, it does seem like a momentous decision, uh, and for it to occur by virtue of this, at least from the perspective of the novel, like minor, relatively minor character, uh, compared to his love for Carla, uh, is. Now, you know, he may not be going specifically for her. He's going because he made a commitment to go or because he, you know, has, he, he wants to honor his word in some sense, I, I, I feel. Uh, but at the same time, I, uh, uh, it's a curious coincidence that both times he, he leaves Carla uh, to meet with Ola or to re- respond to some concern uh, that she has, concern for her safety or for her well-being. Uh, the other, another parallel I, I noticed is this distinction between love and liking, and uh, both Katterby, uh in uh, after their conversation, their philosophical conversation, and then Carla, when she she and uh, she first reencounters uh, Lynn on the beach, there say, "I like you, Lynn," uh, and love is not something that's really on the table for for Carla. Uh, for Katerbai, it's something else. We don't know really his thoughts on love or how he operates in that dimension. But they both say, I like you, Lynn. And uh, again, I just noticed that. I don't know exactly what it means. Um, but uh, a lot of like, people generally like him, uh, it seems. Uh, and, um, and something about his goodness. Like there's something about his goodness that is maybe the quality that he is, is, is emerging like that others are seeing he's maybe not seeing in himself in, in, as, in the same, because he's so racked with uh, guilt and shame and all these other emotions stemming out of the, the event in his life. But uh, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you pointed out that the, the, um, you know, the, the kind of just the, the curiosities uh, in like the decisions that, that he's making uh, and it remains to be seen, of course, what, uh, what transpires from that. Very much so. Did it, um, did it add or detract um, or was it not, not just not inter- particularly of value when I played a clip of the audiobook? Was that fun or was that weird? I think I'm going to have to listen to the audiobook after I finish reading. Uh-huh. I love the uh, the voice, and I want to re- hear uh, the various voices of Prabhakar, in particular Vikram. I nice. just get a kick out of reading it, and you know, b- being around um, some Indian, you know, people, uh, it's like I kind of have that sense of you know that lilting, beautiful quality, especially as it's mixed with um, you know other other accents or other languages. Um, so I think I'll get a kick out of listening to it. So I, I enjoyed it. I even like it when you use your accents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I actually was surprised by the voice when you last played it. It, it, nice. it sounded more, I don't know what I was expecting something different. That's all. Um, maybe something more Australian, like maybe uh, who's that guy, the crocodile Dundee. Like, or oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. Well, I just wanted to offer if we're inclined at all, you know, maybe just to, you know, 45, 50 seconds of the ending of the chapter, which I found to be very poignant. Might be a nice way to put a bow on this. Let's do it. Cool. This is really a great meeting, guys. Thank you so much. This has been beautiful. Thank you. Likewise, I was going to say thank you very much. Mm-hmm. She rose from the waves and walked toward me slowly, dragging her feet through the shifting sand. The singlet and lungi clung to her body. Her black hair gleamed, sleek and wet under the soaring sun. The most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. I love you, I said, as she came into my arms and we kissed. I spoke the words against her lips, her face, her eyes. I held her close to me. I love you. It'll be okay. You'll see. I'll be back soon. No, she answered woodenly, her body not stiff but utterly still, the life and the love drained out of it. It won't be all right. It won't be okay. 
It's over. And I won't be here after today. I looked into her eyes and felt my own body harden, hollowed out by pride. My hands fell from her shoulders. I turned and walked back to the bike. Riding to the last little cliff that gave a view of the beach, our beach, I stopped the bike and shielded my eyes to look for her. But she was gone. There was nothing but the waves, breaking like the curved spines of playful porpoises, and the traceless, empty, tousled sheets of sand. Now I'm going to go cry. <laughs> right. You guys are beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Great. Thank Peace. you, Paul. Mm-hmm.